One of those chapters, nine, maybe we'll go with nine. It sounds like a good one. Uh, so uh, in this chapter here, uh, we've been talking about solutions, I believe. And uh, <clears throat> we've been talking about at the beginning, I think some intermolecular forces. So remember that uh, intermolecular forces are really the forces that hold uh, one molecule. Uh, together basically with another molecule. It could be another molecule that's different, obviously, and it could also be another molecule that's the same type of molecule with itself, basically. Remember that all intermolecular forces pretty much have the same sort of connectivity, and it is a basic connectivity of the negative side of one molecule is attracted basically to the positive side of another, and that is where those guys are basically able to interact with one another. And there are different types of these sort of positive negative inter interactions. Uh, we talked about several kind of the main ones. Uh, we talked about hydrogen bonding and hydrogen bonding is a intermolecular force for polar molecules uh, that obviously have the ability to hydrogen bond. And the way you get sort of the ability to hydrogen bond is you need a bond between hydrogen and either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So some polar molecule or even a nonpolar molecule that has a group like that uh, would have the ability to hydrogen bond. The reason for that is nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine are the most electronegative. So it creates a really good separation of charge within that bond. And that allows that sort of positive and negative attraction to sort of occur uh, between opposite sides. Uh, so something like ammonia, for example, can hydrogen bond because it does have a bond between a nitrogen and a hydrogen. Also something like water can also hydrogen bond. Um, and again, in this case, the uh, more negative would be our nitrogen, more positive would be our hydrogen more positive side of the bond there, our hydrogen and our oxygen being more negative. Uh, this is pretty much the strongest type of intermolecular force that you could have. Um, the next sort of intermolecular force really is a dipole-dipole interaction. And dipole-dipole interactions is really the main intermolecular force that polar molecules also use. But the difference here is they really do sort of lack the ability uh, to hydrogen bond. So those that really cannot hydrogen bond, uh, but they are still polar, uh, will use dipole-dipole interaction. And really the reason they can do that, and really the truth is hydrogen bonding really is a form of dipole-dipole interaction. Um, they're able to do that because they have a dipole moment. And if you remember a dipole moment means that basically no matter what happens with that polar molecule, it will always have a positive side to the molecule and always have a negative side to the molecule. So you can do whatever you want to it, but it will always be basically moving around with that positive negative attraction. So for a sense of sort of bonding through intermolecular forces, it's pretty much good to go the way it is. Um, and Again, another polar molecule, either another one of the same molecule or a different molecule. Once again, you get that positive negative attraction. And that's also a relatively strong one. Um, the weakest out of all of them that we talked about, I think was dispersion forces. And dispersion forces is really the main root of sort of interaction that nonpolar molecules basically take. Uh, nonpolar molecules basically mean right that they are sharing those electrons equally overall. And for all intents purposes, they are essentially neutral. There is really no positive side or negative side in a nonpolar molecule. So these are the guys that has to sort of rely upon something to happen to allow them to interact with others. Uh, one way that it can happen is electrons could just decide because they're moving around to all sort of migrate to one side of the molecule versus the other. And that will temporarily create a side of the molecule that is more negative and a side that's more positive. And again, if it's near another nonpolar molecule that's sitting there, the electrons and this guy will go the opposite way 
And now again, these two guys that normally do not have charges will temporarily gain charges and they have a way to sort of interact with each other for you know a short period of time. That's what's known as polarizability, the ability or the ease at which those electrons basically can move from one side to the next. The other way you could do that is you can induce it. We talked, I think, about an in ion induced or dipole induced uh, force. And that's when a, either a polar molecule or an ion sort of comes upon a nonpolar molecule. It will sort of cause that separation of the electrons and cause that temporary charge basically to occur. These are really weak of all of them and really temporary type of attractive forces because again, as the electrons move back or everybody kind of goes back to their normal situation, uh, they'll kind of break apart and make new ones. So dispersion forces is pretty much the weakest uh, type of intermolecular force that you could have. And as we talked about, all these intermolecular forces affect things like boiling points, melting points, and things of that nature. If you have a really strong intermolecular force, you would expect that substance to have a higher boiling point or melting point. And that's because they're going to be held together a lot tighter. In order for something to boil, they got to separate from each other. So if they're held together by a really strong force, it's going to take a lot more energy to get them to separate. And that translates into a higher boiling point or melting point. Opposite is true if they have something like dispersion forces, which is a relatively weak force, they're going to be able to pretty much go into the gas phase really easily because it's not going to take a lot of energy for those guys to kind of separate from one another. And they typically have much lower boiling points and melting points, uh, things that rely upon dispersion forces. So I think we talked a little bit about some organic compounds like methane, butane, propane. Again, you're probably familiar with those things. And they're pretty much gases because they're basically using dispersion forces that are not held together very, very tightly. So it doesn't take a lot for those guys just to kind of go away from each other and kind of go into the gas phase. So things with really weak intermolecular forces are sometimes referred to as being volatile. They're able to enter the gas phase really, really easily. Now, for the most part, everybody, even polar molecules can use dispersion forces. And that's why, you know, for a temporary sort of deal, you know, even something that's polar, non-polar would sort of mix for a bit. I think maybe I used the oil and vinegar sort of salad dressing example, you know, they'll kind of stay mixed for a bit, but eventually over a long period of time, they really don't have a way to maintain that interaction. And they really will sort of separate out from one another. <clears throat> Other thing that's really important with intermolecular forces is, it really does affect the solubility of one substance and another. That's pretty much what makes things soluble in each other or insoluble in each other. So if you try to mix two solutions that basically use the same type of intermolecular force as they use with themselves, then they're going to be really soluble in each other. If you try to mix a couple of things that, for example, one uses like water, hydrogen bonding, and maybe something like oil, which uses dispersion forces, they really have no way to interact well with one another and they really will be insoluble in each other. Hence, if you think about any type of oil spill we've had in the water in the ocean, right? The oil just floats on the top of the water, right? They really don't mix. And that's because they don't have a way to interact with each other. Any questions on that stuff there? <clears throat> we also talked about some other things like I think cohesive forces and adhesive forces. And, you know, uh, we also talked about, I think, surface tension. And um, at the end there, we talked about vapor pressure. So uh, obviously intermolecular forces is important for vapor pressure. Again, things with weak intermolecular forces will typically have a higher vapor pressure. The vapor pressure, if you remember, is basically the pressure of the gas over the liquid part. So things with really weak intermolecular forces will allow those guys really to escape into the gas phase really to eat relatively easily. That means you will have more gas molecules over the liquid and thus have a higher vapor pressure than something with a much stronger intermolecular force. It will keep those guys in the liquid phase a lot longer, which means less of them can escape to the gas phase and you would have less gas molecules over the liquid and obviously a lower vapor pressure. Any questions on any of that? I think we did a calculation at the very end, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Questions? All right, then let's continue on our journey here through liquid. 
So let's talk a little bit about the process here of boiling. Uh, boiling uh, is obviously when we heat it, water, for example, uh, to a high temperatures, we start to get basically bubbles of water vapor that forms beneath the surface. Uh, you might have noticed when you heat water, like when you first hit it with the heat, you'll see a bunch of these dots look like bubbles and they're really not bubbles it's obviously not boiling right away as you hit it with the heat what you're actually doing when you hit it with the heat is you're making things like carbon dioxide less soluble so that's what pops out really quickly because you hit it with a really hot flame at the beginning they eventually go away but what happens eventually though is you really do get the solution to start to boil and that's when we start to get some actual bubbles that form and inside the bubbles is water vapor for example in the uh, case of water. And if the uh, pressure inside the bubble is less than the sort of atmospheric pressure, you'll see the bubbles pop before they reach the surface. When you finally really get it going and boiling, that means that the pressure kind of inside the bubble is equal to or maybe even a little bit greater than the atmospheric pressure. That's going to allow the bubble basically to get to the top. And that's really when you got it actually starting to boil. At what temperature something boils depends on the temperature and the pressure. So pressure does play a role in sort of the boiling point and where things will boil. Uh, so obviously if your pressure is greater or less than say uh, atmospheric pressure or sea level, you know, for example, things can boil at a lower temperature or higher temperature depending on where you're at. If you kind of play with the pressure. Now, when we raise the pressure, for example, in a pressure cooker, uh, after we put the lid on and we get these guys to start to boil, as these guys start to evaporate, it really has nowhere to go. So that tight lid holds that vapor pressure above the water and it results in the boiling water, you know, sort of boiling a little bit higher. And obviously you could cook your food a little bit, maybe faster, a little nicer as well. Now boiling as weird as it sounds, you know, is sort of a cooling process overall and maybe you've experienced this or not but you know sometimes people get really worried when they boil water and they have a thermometer in there because a lot of thermometers you know they top out at like 102 ish or something like that and you keep seeing it increasing increasing so people used to be frightened of is going to keep increasing and maybe pop and break the thermometer but it doesn't do that if you ever kept the thermometer in there right when it hits the boiling point it basically is able to maintain it and that's because as you are boiling, you are obviously heating from the bottom. So all these guys gain a lot of energy and they're starting to boil. But what happens is you are releasing a lot of that energy out the top. And when it hits the boiling point, you're actually cooling just as fast as you're sort of heating at that point, which is why the boiling point will basically hit it and stay there. It won't continue to rise uncontrollably and like break your thermometer if you're in there and stuff like that. So as you heat from the bottom, you're kind of cooling from the top. And as you get that boiling point, that's why again, you know, for example, in an ideal situation, uh, 100 degrees Celsius would be the boiling point uh, for water. And it will basically stay at 100 degrees as it's boiling and, and continue to boil. Now, liquid and the gas phase, obviously, as we go from uh, liquid to gas, that is the process of evaporation or vaporization. Going the opposite way, if we have gas and we want to go back to liquid, that is the process of condensation. The process of evaporation uh, is endothermic, which means that we put heat and energy in to do that, right? So you got to put heat and energy in to say liquid water to get it to boil. The process of condensation is exothermic, which means heat and energy is released. So you release energy. And here you absorb energy. And when we release that energy in an exothermic process, what happens is, frankly, the gas molecules that are flying around no longer have enough energy basically to escape each other. So as they collide, they kind of stick and drop back into the solution. At the surface of any liquid, you basically have this exchange going on. 
you have you know any liquid you got guys that are jumping out of the solution and you got guys that are dropping back in to the liquid part of it at the surface that is why right when we have some type of liquid it can start to evaporate right if you have just a little bit of liquid maybe on the bench or something like that it can start to evaporate <clears throat> So as liquid molecules basically escape the liquid phase, they're taking a lot of that kinetic energy with them. And that's really lowering the kinetic energy of the water. It takes a lot of energy, as we talked about, to get everybody away from each other and sort of escape the liquid part to get into the gas phase. The result of that is that they're using a lot of energy to sort of move through the liquid phase to get into the gas phase. So when they finally do break free, they're actually moving a lot slower than the air molecules that are out there because they use a lot of energy to sort of break themselves free. The result of that is you're sort of adding to the surrounding area a lot of slower moving molecules, which is gonna lower uh, basically the kinetic energy of the air that's around it. So the opposite is true when we go through the process of evaporation. Uh, as water cools, evaporation rate decreases. Uh, we can maintain uh, the rate of evaporation uh, with water that touches a warm surface like your skin. Um, that is why you feel cold, right, when you have water on you. So like when you have water on you and you get out, as you have the pool or something like that, and you have water on your skin, you feel really cold. That is because all the water in your skin is sucking out all the heat from your body, right? To go through the process of evaporation, you feel cold, the water starts to evaporate, you feel really, really cold. The opposite is true, you know, when you take maybe like a shower and it's really steam or there's a lot of steam in the room, right? To create a lot of steam in the room, you have a lot of molecules that are going through condensation, right? That's why the mirror gets all wet and all that as you are maybe taking a shower and stuff like that. So as it goes through condensation, which is an exothermic process, it's releasing all that heat and energy and you feel nice and warm, right? And then when you shut off the shower and you got the water in your body, you're starting to increase the rate of evaporation and you start to feel cold at that point. So the process of evaporation as sort of weird as it sounds, is a cooling process. That is also why we sweat, right? We sweat because we are overheating. So as we sweat, our body will then increase the rate of evaporation and essentially cool us down. That's the practical purpose of sweat, I suppose. Now, as I mentioned before, condensation is sort of the opposite effect there. As we are releasing the energy through the process of condensation, you get a lot more energy being released. And again, if you're a person, you're gonna pick up that energy, which again is why you feel really warm uh, in a sort of environment where there's a lot of condensation happening. That we do have faster moving water vapors tend to bounce off one another in the surface. Uh, and then when they slower moving water vapor molecules condense to liquid phases, hydrogen bonds are made. And when we make bonds, it actually is a, exothermic process that releases energy. Remember, in order to make bonds, everybody's got to kind of slow down and lose some energy so that they could come together to make a bond. That's going to also release some energy. And that's why condensation is sort of a warming process in that sense, uh, because it involves a lot of increase in the release of energy, both to the surroundings uh, and also like the system as well. <clears throat> Now there's a certain amount of energy and we don't talk too much about this in this class anymore, but in 200B we will, uh, but just a sort of preview of it. There is a certain amount of energy that is required to do nothing more than basically change the phase of a substance. And the molar heat of vaporization, which is sometimes referred to as the delta H of vaporization, and that's really the enthalpy, of vaporization. Enthalpy for the most part is like the heat of a reaction. And when we see a delta H value, as we might've talked about before, but just in case not, if you ever see a delta H value, um, really the number, not necessarily really important, but the sign of the number is important. So if you have a delta H value that is negative, that implies that it is a exothermic process and heat and energy is being released. If you see a delta H value that is positive, that implies that that process is an endothermic process. 
and heat and energy is being absorbed in that process. And that's what we see here. As we go from liquid to gas, it takes about 40.7 kilojoules per mole. Uh, this is for water. But if we do the opposite process, uh, go from gas back to liquid, which is condensation, it takes the exact same amount of energy, but it is negative. So it's negative 40.7 kilojoules per mole. That's roughly 2260 joules per gram of energy that is needed to basically either take a substance from liquid to gas or gas to liquid. By the way, does those processes of evaporation and condensation, do they happen at the same temperature or different temperatures? It does happen at the exact same temperature. It happens at the normal boiling point. So for water, we're talking about 100 degrees Celsius and exactly at 100 degrees Celsius, you basically have liquid and gas in equilibrium with each other. So you got a little bit of say liquid water, you got some gas or steam sort of happening. It's really not to sort of get above 100 degrees Celsius, for example, for water that you really have sort of transition into the gas phase. And it's not until you get a little bit below 100 degrees that you're really into the liquid phase, but exactly, you know, at 100 degrees Celsius for water, you basically have both phases uh, in equilibrium with each other. So that was the example I just mentioned that you do feel warm uh, when you're showering because again, you have a lot of heat and energy and steam that is going through condensation and releasing all that energy. But once obviously you stop the shower, you will feel cold because you have a greater rate of evaporation uh, than you do condensation at that point. Now, freezing and melting, sort of the same idea that sort of happens here. Uh, freezing and melting is obviously our transition as we go from solid to liquid and obviously liquid back to solid. And same idea, it is a endothermic process to go from solid to liquid. You have to put heat and energy in. It's a very simple example. It's just an ice cube, right? The ice cube needs to pick up energy, right? As it starts melting, it can even pick up energy, obviously from the outside here, just taking it out. Uh, and opposite here, as we go from liquid to solid, you throw it in the freezer, for example. As you put it in the freezer, it's going to release a bunch of energy. And what that's going to do, again, is allow basically those molecules to lack enough energy to even pass each other. So they come into sort of the solid phase. In the liquid phase, they still have enough energy to basically pass one another, which is why liquids are fluid, right? But as they get into the solid phase, they really do lack the energy to sort of pass one another, the molecules. And again, that's why they are rigid and they sort of lock themselves uh, into place. Same idea as uh, evaporation and condensation. This also occurs at the same temperature. Uh, for example, for water, that is zero degrees Celsius. At zero degrees Celsius, exactly, you have, again, both phases in equilibrium with each other. You have a little bit, say, of ice crystals sort of happening. So you got some solid ice and water, and you have some liquid water that's basically happening at that point. Another kind of interesting thing about water, uh, one of the interesting properties of it is, it is actually one of a few substances where in its solid state, it actually is less dense than its liquid state, right? And that's why when we put ice cubes in our cup, they end up floating to the top, right? Because they're actually less dense than say the liquid water that's in there. And the reason for that is a couple of things, including really the intermolecular forces that water uses, which is hydrogen bonding, because of this relatively strong uh, hydrogen bonding that occurs as the water molecules kind of come together in the solid space, uh, they actually create a bunch of empty space between the different water molecules. So if you think about density, which is mass over volume, if it creates a lot of empty space, you're creating a lot more volume, which means this number gets bigger, density gets smaller. And then you have in liquid water where they're able to still have enough energy to still kind of move around each other and have it really locked tightly into, into place there that you see in the um, solid state. Most substances, as you know, right, in the solid state, they are usually more dense than in the liquid state. So again, water is a very unusual sort of uh, substance in that sense. 
The other couple of transitions of state is sublimation and deposition. Sublimation is a process where you go from solid directly to gas. You skip the whole liquid mess and that is sublimation. Going from gas back to solid, also skipping the liquid part, uh, that is what is known as deposition, like you're depositing something. Sublimation, you may be familiar with like dry ice, right? Dry ice is obviously not water, but it is actually carbon dioxide. But dry ice, if you've ever used it, is really cold. Uh, don't touch it. But uh, dry ice goes from the solid state uh, directly to the gas state. No liquid mess to clean up in the way. Deposition, uh, solid uh, gas back to solid. That's how in some processes they... Do you remember what CDs, DVDs look like, how they get them shiny? They kind of deposit the metals on through a process of deposition onto the surface of those discs. Uh, same idea um, as you go from solid to gas through sublimation, that's an endothermic process. And as you go from the gas back to the solid, that is a exothermic process. So when we do the process of going from solid to liquid and liquid back to solid, there's also a delta H for that. And that is what is sometimes referred to as the delta H of fusion. And that is the energy that's required, again, simply to change the substance at its normal melting point uh, or freezing point uh, from, say, solid to liquid or liquid to solid. It has nothing to do with the temperature change. Um, and then we have our delta H. So this guy is approximately, as you see here, 335 joules per gram. As I mentioned, this is about 2260 joules per gram. It takes a lot more energy to do the transition of going from liquid to gas than it does to go from solid to liquid. And if you think about it, it's because as you go from solid to liquid in the solid state, everybody's relatively very close to each other. In the liquid state, they're still really close to each other, a little bit more room for moving around. But as you transition from the liquid state to the gas state, everybody's completely breaking apart from one another. And as you go into the gas state, they're obviously flying around free from one another. So that takes a lot more energy to do so. Questions on that there. <clears throat> now, when we think about calculating the energy that's required to change the temperature in the same state. So for example, if I wanna know how much energy is needed to change water, liquid water at say 25 degrees Celsius to 35 degrees Celsius. It's basically liquid water in both situations. We won't get into it, but maybe you remember from the pre-class there, that is what we use specific heat for. Maybe you remember that equation? Something like Q is equal to MS delta T. So that's the equation that we use to calculate the heat and energy is required to basically change the temperature of a substance, but not its phase. So if you stay in the same phase, but just change the temperature, you do that, by the way, Q here is heat or energy. And that's either in joules or calories. M is the mass of the substance in grams. S is the specific heat capacity. And that has units of joules per gram per degree Celsius. And change in temperature is uh, basically final temperature minus initial temperature. So you might remember maybe this number, 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius or one calorie per gram per degree Celsius. That is the specific heat capacity of water, liquid water. Um, and again, you sometimes will use that equation uh, with the heat of vaporization and heat of fusion to figure out, you know, how much energy it takes to take, you know, 40 grams of ice from like zero degrees to steam at 102 degrees. Uh, you could kind of calculate that. Uh, we won't do that in this class because they took it out of this class. So we will do it in 200B. We'll talk about that. S is the specific heat capacity. Um, 
And it's sometimes abbreviated as S. Some books will use SH. Some books will use C for it as well. And it's basically the energy required to raise one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So it's basically the energy required to take a, a gram of a substance and basically change the temperature by one degree Celsius. Things with really high specific heat capacities, it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of it very smallly. Like water has a very high specific heat capacity. That's why people get freaked out when the water temperature goes up by like a half a half a degree, because it takes an enormous amount of energy just to move water that small of amount. Um, as opposed to say something like a piece of metal where it's only like 0.2 uh, joules is needed to move uh, you know, a gram of it basically by one degree Celsius. So uh, the smaller the specific heat capacity, the less energy is needed to really make a big sort of temperature change. The larger specific heat capacity, it takes a lot more energy to move the temperature of a substance. Other questions on that? So this is a heating and cooling curve, pretty highlighted, I like it. So this is uh, ice, which is solid. Uh, here's our liquid in this state, and that is obviously our gas up here. So as we talked about here, in sort of the green areas, uh, you would use the specific heat capacity equation if you needed to calculate the energy. Because in any of these green areas here, that is the same phase, uh, but you're changing the temperature. So there's no phase change that occurs. Here in the sort of highlighted in yellow areas, those guys are the same temperature because they're plateaued, but the phase is changing. So this is where we go from liquid to gas. And down here, a lot smaller where we go from solid to liquid. So again, those transitions happen at the exact same temperature, which is why those lines are flat. Uh, the other ones, again, we're staying in the same phase, but we're changing the temperature. So here's where we would use the delta H of vaporization if you need to figure out the phase change. And down here is where we would use the delta H of fusion if we were going to do those calculations. Any questions on that stuff there? <laughs> Yeah. All right, so let's talk a little about phase diagrams, uh, which is really what we uh, will sometimes use uh, to understand what type of temperature pressure combinations we need, uh, you know, to maybe get a substance into a specific phase or what boiling point would be at a specific uh, temperature pressure combinations. So a phase diagram, as we will see, is really a diagram that has temperature on one scale and pressure on the other scale. It shows the three phases, which obviously are gas, liquid, and solid. It has the six inner conversions. By the way, the six inner conversions are what we were just talking about. That is melting. That is freezing. That is evaporation or vaporization. That is condensation. That is sublimation and that is deposition. So all six of those sort of phase changes you could find on a phase diagram and you could find on that particular phase diagram for that substance at what pressure temperature combination uh, those things would occur. There's also a point on the diagram that we will see in just a second, which is referred to as the triple point. The triple point is basically a temperature pressure combination where all three phases are happening at once. So you got solid, liquid, and gas all occurring at the same time. And there's a certain sort of temperature pressure situation that you could get that to occur. Uh, water, as you'll see, has an unusual melting point line. It has a negative slope. Uh, some of the other ones are a little bit more of a positive type slope. And again, that accounts for why ice is less dense than liquid water. So let's take a look at sort of a generic uh, phase diagram here in just a second. But let's talk about these things first. Uh, a couple other important things that we'll see on the diagram is what's sometimes referred to as the critical temperature. The critical temperature is the temperature above where there really is no distinction between liquid and the gas phase. They just kind of flow into each other. It's also where we find usually our supercritical fluid, which you know has properties sort of of both. 
Uh, and that's also a point where it's known as the critical pressure where that occurs. It is also sometimes just referred to as the critical point. And that's the uh, pressure temperature where, again, yeah, there's kind of no distinction between those two phases. They kind of flow into each other. And above that critical point, that is where we find what is referred to as a supercritical fluid. And that is a, a substance that has the density of a liquid, uh, but it does sort of flow like a gas. And again, that's because you're in that area where liquid and gas sort of just start to blend together. And so you got this sort of substance at that point that you know, does have sort of properties of both a liquid and a gas. So now let's look, I think, at a generic phase diagram. So this is sort of a generic phase diagram. And again, we have the three phases, solid, liquid, and gas. And this is typically how they are kind of left to right there, solid, liquid, and gas is sort of how you find those spots. And we have our transition here. This is our melting and freezing point line here. So as we transition from solid to liquid, that's melting. As we go from liquid back to solid, that's freezing. Here's our transition between liquid and gas. So as we go from our gas back to into our liquid, as condensation and our liquid into our gas is our vaporization. Down low here on this diagram, this is the transition between solid and gas. So this is where sublimation occurs. So we go directly across that line, we're into gas, and that would be sublimation. We're skipping the entire liquid area that's up here. And if we go the other way, that is deposition. Right here is the triple point, and that is again where we have all three of those phases occurring. And up here is the critical point, and that's where we have our critical temperature and our pressure. And you can see above it, again, there's really no, kind of no boundary between that liquid and gas phase, and that is where we see our supercritical fluid. If we we're talking about <laughs> normal boiling point, normal freezing point, at what pressure would that occur? What is the normal boiling point and freezing point standard condition pressure would be one atmosphere. Yeah, so one atmosphere is where you would normally have your freezing point and boiling point. So let's just, for example, say that this was at one atmosphere. We could draw a line across and this is where we would have freezing and boiling happening at whatever temperature that would be. And this is where we would have evaporation and condensation happening, uh, whatever temperature that would be. So typically at one atmosphere is where that normal sort of boiling and freezing points would occur. And you can see that. You can see in this case, if I wanted sublimation to occur, I would definitely need to drop the pressure, right? In my case here, to get me to cross over in this region uh, for to go through, um, sublimation or even deposition heading in the opposite direction. So you do need to know uh, a phase diagram where you find solid liquid gas, where you find like the triple point, the critical point, the super critical fluid, and again, where those transitions should be occurring. So let's take a look at uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, here is the CO2 or carbon dioxide, basically dry ice. And uh, these are the pressures on the left there, and these are our normal temperature. So again, we have our solid, liquid, and gas. This would be our triple point, uh, which is a pressure looks like about 5.1 needed for all three of those phases to occur. This is our critical point up here, where above it, we would have our supercritical fluid. Now, under normal conditions, right, that is one atmosphere. And say you have dry ice at room temperature. That means I would draw my line this way to like room temperature, maybe somewhere in there. What happens at room temperature is it goes directly from solid to gas, no liquid, right? Which is what happens with dry ice. I did not cross into the liquid phase. If I wanted to force dry ice to go into the liquid phase under say normal conditions, where would I need to get the pressure above? I asked to at least get it above 5.1, right? So if I get it above 5.1, I 
and I get into this area here, I could actually force it to go through all three phases at that point. That's about five times normal pressure, right? So hence why dry ice doesn't in normal conditions get into that liquid phase. Yeah, so you would really have to force a pretty high pressure to do that. Um, <clears throat> if you wanted to keep it in the liquid phase, you would need that pressure above 5.1 and you would need to keep the temperature this way of whatever that is, right? It's about 20 this maybe or 10 or whatever it may be. So you gotta keep the temperature in that range to keep it in the liquid phase. So you can see here under normal conditions, not going to happen uh, for something like dry ice. This is why we do see it just kind of skip that phase. And the reason behind it really is the pressure that would be necessary uh, to keep it in a certain phase and temperature. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> yeah, so if you immediately release the pressure, it would drop down, right? So even wherever temperature it may be at, at that point, it will drop the pressure. So let's just say you kept it here at enough pressure to keep it there. But when you did drop the pressure, it's basically gonna drop down, right? So it's gonna go right into, the, it's gonna go right through sublimation. It's gonna evaporate at that point since it would be in liquid. So it would go into the gas phase, yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions on that? All right, so why don't you try that? So we'll take a look here at CO2's graph again. So using the diagram, what we want to know is what phase or phases Okay, let's take a look here and see. Uh, so we'll start at 20 degrees and 72.9. So 20-ish uh, degrees Celsius, maybe be in this ballpark. And 72.9 would obviously be right there. So we should be in the liquid phase at that point. Coming next to minus 56.7 and 5.1. So this is uh, minus 56.7. Uh, 5.1 puts us right there, and that would be our triple point, which means all three phases are happening at once, so we would have solid, liquid, and gas uh, basically occurring at that point. If I did uh, 10 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere, so one atmosphere is here, 10 degrees is somewhere in this ballpark, which is not labeled here, but this is the gas part of the system here. And that would definitely be a gas. Any question on those so far? Coming to minus 78.5 and one atmosphere would put me right there, I think. Right there. And I am actually on the line, yes. So that line is between solid and gas, which means during a phase change, you have both things happening at once. So you got a little solid and gas basically happening exactly at that point. And lastly, at 50 degrees Celsius, this should be back over here, perhaps, and 80 atmospheres. That seems like a lot. We are definitely above our critical point. So that is where we would have our super critical fluid basically occurring. Any questions on any of those there? So obviously, like I said, you need to uh, understand the phase diagram and be able to make these type of readings. Yes. It may not show you the solid liquid or gas. Uh, so you, you need to know where it should be. And that's normally the arrangement kind of left to right, solid liquid and then gas to the right is uh, typically how it's arranged that way. So you do need to be able to know where the solid liquid and gas should be. And you also should know obviously where, you know, melting and freezing should occur normally and boiling and evaporation or evaporation condensation and sublimation and deposition should occur. Other questions? Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. It may have, I may have uh, some lines or no lines, but it may have some temperature readings and pressure. It will have some numbers. It won't be completely blank on the temperature or pressure side, but uh, so it, if you're asking, um, I guess uh, it will have, 
it, it will have like these lines if that's what you're asking. Yeah, it will have those lines on them, but it may not say solid, liquid, or gas. And it will have, and it does vary depending on these type of graphs as to sort of how they do the scaling. So sometimes the scaling, as you can see, isn't perfect, like one, two, three, four, five. So there's sort of a rough distance between it. Uh, but it'll have some type of scaling on both sides and it'll have those kind of main lines that separate out the solid liquid and gas but it may not be labeled solid liquid and gas so other questions hold on okay all right that's a uh ice skating blade i like it all right i was having fun making pictures it's all right so we talked a little bit about water some of its unusual sort of properties um Obviously, um, one of the major differences, as we talked about, is that hydrogen bonding, which creates a lot of open volume between those water molecules, especially when it goes into the solid state. And we do see uh, the density of ice being less dense than, say, liquid water. By the way, as you may know or may not know, density does change with temperature, right? So um, it does change with temperature, kind of like those tables we looked up, I think, the other day uh, for the density of water. Now, um, that's really good because when water expands, uh, it does freeze. And obviously we've known that we probably all maybe have done it right, throw a soda or some beverage item there in the freezer and forget about it, right? And maybe you come back and your can is now has a nice big old round bottom, right? Because all the water molecules in there are now freezing and expanding and the can is getting in its way, right? So um, that's basically what's happening again as it goes in from the liquid to the solid, it's increasing that volume. And then we get the wobbly can at the bottom there that's coming out the bottom. <clears throat> now, water and how it freezes is really good because uh, the sort of, Highest density water is actually uh, four degrees Celsius. Um, so water freezes from top to bottom or bottom to top? Water actually freezes from top to bottom, which is good for fishes and sea life, right? That's why you can still go ice fishing, which is probably not good for fishes and sea life. But uh, if it froze the other way around, right? Everybody would be ice cubes. That'd be really sad lake and freezing water like that. Uh, but what happens is really the warm water starts to go to the bottom, right? The cold water kind of goes up because it's less dense. And then it really starts to freeze at the top, right? which is why they yell at you. It might not be completely frozen as we walk on it because it's just a small layer at that point and you could break yourself through and then you will be in cold water for yourself there. Um, but it will start to freeze. And what that will actually do is create an insulated layer up on top and actually keep the warm water, you know, in that quarter four degrees Celsius, which is really good for our good friend here, Melvin, the fish which will join Dalton and his bowling on Thursday on the next well don't yell at me when i ask what's the name of the fish and you don't know it's melvin all right now i know melvin looks like he's in an ice cube but it was like a lot old clip art a long time ago so it's just a scene that's really not an ice cube and he's swimming happily because once again here uh, what's going to happen in this situation is um the warmer water will float to the bottom there the colder water will come to the top. And again, it creates that sort of ice layer. And again, it helps obviously keep everybody there swimming and happy in a sense. Yeah. All right. So much like Dalton, don't forget Melvin's name. Uh, I look forward to seeing what you wrote for phenol failing as well and the spellings. All right. So now we talked a little bit about liquid. Let's talk just a little bit about solid and go crazy with the solids here. Let's talk about different types of solids. Uh, solids are rigid. Uh, they obviously uh, cannot transmit pressure in all directions. Um, they have varying degree of hardness. And there's a couple of different types of solids. There's a crystalline solid. And those are kind of like ionic compounds. They have a very, very ordered pattern as to how they come together. Uh, for example, like an ionic compound, the positive and negative guys really do sort of line up in a very ordered pattern. As we'll talk about in a second here, it is so ordered that you could pretty much just take a small little piece of it 
and you pretty much could rebuild the whole sort of structure from that small piece because it is so ordered. You have these very much repeating pieces that happen. Uh, amorphous solids do exhibit a lot less of that long range order. So things like glass and a lot of organic polymers are more of an amorphous solid. We're gonna kind of focus in on crystal lattices, which come from these more ordered arrangements and that crystalline solid. So when these guys really do come together, you know, especially say like an ionic compound, you know, they do arrange themselves in this pretty nicely ordered arrangement that occurs. The result of that is uh, these arrangements are sometimes referred to as a crystal lattice. And you, like I said, you could pretty much sample the smallest unit of it and really rebuild the entire structure. So when we do select, say, a unit cell, we do want to be sort of particular on how we sort of pick it. So for example, here in my really bad non-three-dimensional drawing, we're just going to say these are a bunch of really ordered arrangements of a molecule. And you may think to yourself, well, if I wanted to pick something there to use as, say, my unit cell, this sort of repeating unit that I could really rebuild the pattern, it would perhaps make sense to just grab me a molecule or an atom there. And if you did that and sort of chose that as your unit cell, sure, you could put it down there, that little circle, but you really have no relationship to where the next one should go, right? Like, I don't know, does it go like right to the left, to the right, to the top, to the bottom? So typically when we sort of choose unit cells or wanna pick unit cells, we want to kind of pick a unit cell that not only has some information about a particular molecule in there, but also some neighboring information about other molecules. So for example, if I picked a unit cell, say like this, and I pull that unit cell out, let me get rid of this guy here. And if I pull this guy out here, what I now have is not necessarily a relationship of just one atom, but I know now that if I stack another one of these squares right on top, I will now know that these guys would fit together like so. And if I pop another one over here to the right, and I drew them much neater and more equal, we would have that. And now just repeating this pattern here, I am now recreating obviously the entire sort of structure by taking that cell. So when we do sort of pull those unit cells, what we want is obviously some neighboring information about how these guys are connected. Any questions on that there? And that's what we see here. Uh, we see here, these are what are sometimes referred to as lattice points. And again, by grabbing, say, that as your unit cell, we also see, in addition to sort of the neighboring guys, we actually have a whole atom or molecule there stuck in the center. And that allows us, once again, to just keep piling those guys together to rebuild that structure. And we could really rebuild it. So uh, the could unit cell will allow you to really have some neighboring information to really put everybody back together sort of in their correct uh, orientation. There's seven different types of unit cells and clearly we're not going to talk about those. We're going to just focus in on cubic unit cells, which all angles are 90 degrees. I don't, I can't even pronounce these bottom ones. So I'm not going to even look at them and stuff like that. Um, I know you can, I know it's all right. Um, I failed math. All right, let me laugh. All right, so uh, cubic uh, all have 90 degrees. Uh, the lengths are all equal to each other. So it makes it really easy. So when we look at the unit cells, there's a couple of things that happen with them. And uh, one is what is referred to as the coordination number. And the coordination number is basically uh, the number of particles that are in contact with one another. Uh, for ions, the number of oppositely charged ions that are in contact with one another is known as its uh, coordination number. The higher the coordination number means there's a much stronger attractive forces between the different molecules and it holds that crystal together a lot tighter. 
something we're not going to get into too much of is packing efficiency. And that's the percentage at which you could kind of get everybody in there, kind of packed together really tight. Uh, the higher the coordination number, usually you'll have a more efficiently packing because everybody's really attracted to one another and they can kind of all fit together in a nice pattern. So cubic unit cells, as I mentioned before, have all 90 degree uh, angles at the corner. The length of the edges are equal to each other. And depending on how the unit cell is sort of taken, you could end up in a corner of all the cubes will result in an eighth of a cell. Or, I'm sorry, an eighth of an atom will be found in each of the corners. And since it's a cube, there's eight corners and that one eighth times eight is like a whole atom, I think, when you do that math there. Um, if you have a half atom on the face, so if you had an atom that was sort of sliced, and half there by the face of a cube, you'll get a half an atom that's sitting there on there. And you'll get a fourth of an atom on each edge. And you can have a entire atom in a three-dimensional cube sort of sitting in the center of the cube as well. For the most part, most of ours, since they are cubes here and not really spears, uh, to figure out the volume of it. It is the length cubed. So the length cubed is an important one. That's the same idea as when we did density, right? You take length times width times height, like centimeters times centimeters times centimeters, gives you cubic centimeters here. And uh, that is obviously a volume. <clears throat> so let's talk about the three types of cubic cells that we're going to uh, focus in on in this class and that you are uh, sort of responsible for. We have simple cubic, which is uh, sometimes abbreviated as just SC. And it has basically one atom per unit cell. So that's really important to know. We're gonna go through each of these individually in just a second, one more time. Um, but it does have one atom per cell. It has a coordination number of six. To calculate the edge length, you take two times the radius, and it has 52% packing efficiency, not all important for us. The next type of cubic cell is what is referred to as a body-centered cubic cell, sometimes BCC is referred to. It has an eighth of an atom in each of the corners, and as you can maybe see here, we'll take a look at some better pictures in a bit. Uh, it's got like a whole entire atom kind of sandwiched in the middle there. So it actually has two atoms per unit cell, one entire atom in the center, and basically an eighth of an atom on each of the corners, which should give you your two atoms. To calculate the edge length, it is four times the radius divided by the square root of three. And as you can see here, that's a little higher coordination number, and we do get a little bit better uh, packing efficiency because there's going to be better association of everybody together. The last one is a face-centered cubic, FCC. It actually has four atoms per unit cell. In this case, there's actually a half atom on each of the faces. So you got a half atom on each of the faces, and you still have, obviously there's six faces, right? So six divided by two is three whole atoms on each, taking all the faces of the cube together. And it has an eighth of an atom there on the corners of the cube. Uh, it's actually sometimes two times R divided by the square root of two is really the uh, way that you calculate the uh, edge length on that. And you can see with this one, a much higher coordination number because you got pretty much atoms all over the place. They're going to be coming in contact with each other as they get rebuilt to so get a much better sort of packing efficiency that occurs. So take a look at each of these uh, a little bit closer. This is our simple cubic. And once again, we have that eighth of an atom on each of the corners. And again, it is two times R, or the radius there, to calculate the length. And again, you can kind of see here, there's sort of an eighth of an atom there on each of those corners as you get it off the square. And that's where you can see there. So that's your eighth of an atom there on each of those corners. <clears throat> 
The body centered, as I mentioned, has the entire whole atom sitting there in the center. And once again, at each of the corners there, we'll get you your other atom there and one on that side over there. And again, here you can see them a little bit better. Uh, we got our eighth of an atom and then again, our whole atom sitting right there in the center. And lastly, our face-centered guy. Uh, we got, again, a half atom on each of these faces. So one atom there, two atoms on there, and three atoms for those two guys. And again, an eighth of an atom on each of those corners for a grand total of four. So to do calculations, which is where we're going to kind of go over here in just a second, a lot of times what we will be calculating is the density in grams per cubic centimeter. So to help you calculate the density, it's good to know the number of atoms in each of these different types of unit cells and also how to calculate the radius there or the length for each of these different ones. <clears throat> This particular case, we want to calculate the density of aluminum uh, if it crystallizes in a face centered and has a radius of 143 picometers. So here we are going to be looking for the density in grams per cubic centimeter. So really, when you do these type of calculations, there's really kind of two parts to it. It's kind of the grams part, and then there's kind of the volume part on the bottom. Uh, so the important thing here is the information that it gives us, which means it is a face centered. So that is the one where we have basically a half an atom on each of the faces. So that gives us three atoms. And then in the corner, we have another atom. So that is four total atoms. So the four total atoms is important because basically what we have is four atoms of aluminum. And if I want to go from atoms, say, to moles, I could use our friend Avogadro's number to do that, right? So we could use Avogadro's number to go from atoms to moles. So we will use Avogadro's number here, 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms per mole of aluminum. Now, if I stop there, I'd be in moles, but I am looking for grams. So I will use the molar mass from the periodic table, which is 2698 grams per mole of aluminum. Our aluminum will cancel, moles of aluminum will cancel, atoms will cancel, and that will give us our grams. So if we do that there, we end up with uh, four times 26.98 divided by Avogadro's number, making sure to use our exponent button. That is going to get us, uh, we'll call it 1.79 times 10 to the minus 22 grams. So believe it or not, that is the top part of what we need for our density. Now the bottom part is gonna come from basically the radius that they gave us. And also based on this unit cell, which is a face centered, it has a specific edge length that you could calculate, which is in this case, the length is equal to two times R times the square root of two. Now, at some point, because you're looking for the density in grams per cubic centimeters, my radius is in picometers. So at some point you need to get yourself into centimeters. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is because I need to end up in centimeters cubed, I'm going to convert up front the picometers into centimeters. That way I'm good to go at the end. I don't have to do the conversion at the end. So that's really the first thing I'm going to do. As you can see here, pico is 10 to the minus 12. So we'll take the radius and we're really just converting the units at this point, 143 picometers. And in a picometer, there is 10 to the minus 12 meters, but I don't want meters, I want centimeters. So there are 100 centimeters in a meter. And that's gonna get me really into the correct units that I need, which is centimeters. So if I do that, I got 143 times 10 to the minus 12 uh, times 100. 
And that is going to give me one point four three times ten to the minus eight centimeters. Any question on that conversion? Now that I have it in centimeters, I can throw this into my length equation to give me the length of the cell or the edge length of a cell. And that would be the length is equal to two times my radius, which I've already converted into centimeters, which is good. Times the square root of two. And if we do that, uh, we end up with this times two times the square root of two. That is gonna give me 4.04 times 10 to the minus eight centimeters. This is the length, is this the volume? This is not the volume, we're dealing with a cubic unit cell, which means the volume is equal to the length cubed, right? That is how we're going to get to cubic centimeters. Basically, this guy cubed will get a centimeter times centimeters times centimeters. So we're going to cube this guy to get us to our volume. And if we do that, uh, we will end up with something cubed. We will end up with a volume of 6.62 times 10 to the minus 23 and since I cube it, these will now become cubic centimeters at this point. Yeah. Any questions on that? That is now the bottom part that I need, right? So now I could actually calculate the density by dividing those two numbers. And if I do that, I'm going to take the grams, which was 1.79 times 10 to the minus 22 grams divided by our volume of 6.62 times 10 to the minus 23. And if we do that, we end up with a density of, long way to get to this small number, 2.71 divided by grams divided by centimeters, which would represent the density of aluminum. <laughs> So this is why I said earlier, it's important to know how many atoms each of those different types of unit cells make, because it's a very common question pretty much to calculate the density of these different atoms. Um, and that will allow you to get to really the grams part of the density. And also obviously the length part where you would incorporate the radius, which is typically given to you is also very important. So you can get to the volume part. Uh, variation of this would be they maybe give you the density and you kind of work backwards to maybe like a, a length of a edge or something like that, or maybe grams or something like that kind of working backwards is, you know, a variation of it. Any questions on that one there? I would say in most cases, this usually will be grams per cubic centimeters is typically what it is because it is still a solid, right? We're, we're talking about solids and typically make sure it is clear. All right, so why don't you try this one here? All right, estimate the density of rubidium if it crystallizes in a body centered and has a radius of 247.5 picometers. So as we saw previously, 10 to the minus 12, right? In our pico. And rubidium is something, 80 something, uh, bless you. 80 plus 85, 47 will that work? For the periodic table. All right, so see what you come up with here.
Okay, so this is we're towards the end here. Let's take a look at it here, see how we're doing. Uh, so first off, we have uh, body centered, which should be two atoms, right? Uh, that's one where there's a whole atom in the center, and then we got everybody on the corner there for the second atom. Uh, also, in terms of the uh, length there, uh, that should be our... Uh, we got there our square root of three, I believe. There, I got it right. Oops. So we have our four r square root of three. So we have both of the things we need. So we'll start with the grams part again. So we'll do our two atoms. Uh, we have our Avogadro's number to get us into moles. And we have our molar mass there of 85, 47 grams per mole. Going to once again, give us the grams part of our density of uh, two times 85, 47 divided by Avogadro's number. Looks like a uh, 2.84 times 10 to the minus 22 grams. Once again, just like I did before, I'm gonna personally convert it up front into centimeters, so I don't have to worry about it later. Uh, so I'm gonna take uh, 247.5, which is my radius, uh, picometers, a picometer being 10 to the minus 12 meters, and then to our centimeters, which is ultimately where we wanna end up. Meters cancel, picometers cancel. Gives us uh, 247.5, times 10 to the minus 12 times 100 uh, gets us uh, 2.4, I'll just round it up, why not, to 8 times 10 to the minus 8 uh, centimeters. Remember, again, that is not our length, so we do need to uh, go into our length here, and that is going to be 4 times my radius, which is 2.48 times 10 to the minus eight centimeters divided by the square root of three. So we'll take that times it by four divided by the square root of three. And that looks like it gets us uh, 5.72 times 10 to the minus eight centimeters. Once again, to get to our volume, we're going to cube that. So we'll take that guide there 